please welcome Professor Myron Scholes. Thank you um, uh, very much, actually. Uh, I always get worried as you get very old that your introduction will take up the entire time for your presentation. So there is a theorem about that and the limiting conditions. The, uh, I uh, want to talk today about, uh, as mentioned, about capital structure and, um, and optionality. But I also um, want to uh, talk for a moment about uh, uh, Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani and coming here to South Africa for the presentation. I noticed when uh, Joel, said, uh, Joel Stern said that when he asked us all to come here, um, that uh, South Africa, that we all agreed to come, part uh, because it was uh, Merton Miller and because in part Joel's persuasiveness. But what he failed to uh, inform you was that he said that he would pay me uh, $100,000 to come. What he failed to, I missed didn't hear, I think, that it would be in uh, Zimbabwe dollars. So, um, the, um, the interesting uh, part of this is that uh, a lot of uh, people here today go back uh, both from uh, my, my association with uh, Merton Miller and then uh, my association with uh, Franco Modigliani, because uh, I was an assistant associate professor with, along with Stu Myers and uh, Bob Merton and, and Franco Modigliani at um, MIT as well. So I guess I bridge uh, both gaps. But um, one of the interesting things about uh, uh, Merton Miller, as uh, Dick alluded to, was his uh, tremendous um, sense of humor and his great uh, love of people, great love of understanding economics and really building the field of finance. I, uh, was fortunate to uh, be there at that time when the field was very young and just uh, just growing. I think that the uh, member of story that uh, Mert Miller and I used to teach together in the downtown program at the University of Chicago, and uh, we used to go for dinner prior to teaching at night. And uh, one. Um, and Merton used to always have one of those martinis uh, before uh, dinner, before, uh, during dinner, before class. And this one time he had two martinis. I was worried about that uh, because he was uh, miffed about something or other. And then he got to class and he, as usual, would write his equations on the f blackboard and a student was trying to interrupt uh, Merton and say, uh, Professor Miller, Professor Miller, and Merton would uh, shoo him away and say, wait a sec till I get the equations on the board. He went to the second board and did the same thing and filled the third board and uh, finally he turned to the student in exasperation and says, oh, what is it now? You know, what do, what do you want? And, and the student said, um, Professor Miller, you're in the wrong class. Um, but having colleagues as, uh, as Richard Rowe and Michael Jensen as colleagues at, along with others was a, a wonderful experience, especially in a period in which the field of finance was very young and there wasn't uh, a great amount of uh, literature you can rely on, so it was fun to be in the pioneering world at that time. Joel Stern was a classmate of mine in uh, Merton Miller's class. Um, and uh, he actually is responsible indirectly uh, for what's become Scholl's Law, as uh, referred to by Merton in, uh, in his book with uh, Gene Fama. But Joel Stern, every uh, class would ask, you know, Joel's a very practical person and would ask uh, Merton what the cost of capital was. And uh, Merton would uh, reply, wait, Joel, we're not there yet. We'll get to that later in the course. So finally on the last day, Joel uh, finally had Merton Corner and said, this is the last class. You have to tell me what the cost of capital is. And uh, I put up my hand and uh, Merton turns to me because, uh, and, and he said, oh, yes, yes. And I said, well, the cost of capital is 10%. So he said, 10%, how do you know that? I said, every professor uses 10%. 
uh, in defining the cost of capital, so it must be 10%, and that, that became Scholl's law. So, and I don't know if Joel was satisfied at that particular time. Um, the actual um, uh, papers I wrote, I uh, was fortunate to be able to write um, five or six papers with uh, Merton uh, Miller, including uh, papers that Dick alluded to and talked about, um, both a theoretical paper on dividends and taxes, and then uh, empirical tests of, uh, of uh, dividends uh, with uh, Merton. Uh, we also had some papers on uh, tests of the capital asset pricing model, and uh, one on um, a paper on executive compensation, which uh, Joel uh, Stern asked us to present at a conference that he was running for some accountants. And at the end of our discussion, he was so exasperated that he got up, Joel got up and said, you people, this is what they were saying and how important it was. So that didn't leave me with a great feeling that I was communicating correctly at that particular moment. And I think we were, uh, I think Merton got 35 out of 36 in his ranking, and I got 36 out of 36 in my ranking. So, but um, it, it's um, it's been a lot of um, of uh, fun over the years to uh, uh, remember back, in particular, of uh, how important uh, Merton Miller was to me and my research and my thinking, and a lot of what Dick uh, Roll talked about in his presentation come home um, to a fairly well. Well, the um, interesting uh, part of the arbitrage uh, proof, as Dick suggested uh, in his talk, was, as I have here at the bottom, is um, really the key to my thinking over the years, and uh, that markets work, and that substitution, the ability to think about how you would substitute on either personal account or be able to substitute on uh, one security for another uh, was the key to a lot of my thinking and it was part of my thesis, uh, the idea, degree of uh, substitution of uh, particular securities, and it's also the key to the way I think about my uh, business currently and uh, how uh, markets operate, that securities, if mispriced, as uh, Stu Myers talked about, soon uh, come back to equilibrium prices in a very uh, quick uh, period of time. So I think that um, that, that is, uh, uh, is, is very important and was the foundation for my thinking along with that of uh, Fisher Black, who is also a great admirer of uh, Merton Miller's uh, in how we developed the, uh, the option pricing technology and uh, were able to uh, you know, crack uh, that particular problem. So I think that the, um, uh, when we think about uh, capital structure issues, um, that one of the interesting uh, parts of the capital structure, which really excited me when I first um, thought about options and was working on options uh, and the option pricing technology, was that um, how did uh, how would we price risky debt? Because in the uh, in Miller Medigliani world, there was um, uh, risky debt was really not part of their uh, lexicon. It was just that we had debt and equity. And actually, if you think about the firm, and, uh, and we called our paper the pricing of options and corporate liabilities, uh, the firm itself be, uh, has value. The assets of the firm are valuable. And the um, debt and equity are options. The equity is a call option in the sense that the equity holders have the right to buy back the firm by paying off the debt on its expiration, and the, or they can have the right to put the firm to the equity holders in uh, a bankruptcy situation. So that would be if the, if the face amount of the debt is 100, and the value of the firm is above 100, say 200, then obviously the equity holders would pay off the debt for 100 and subtract the 100 from the 200 of value of the firm and have 100 left. Um, on the other hand, if the value of the firm were less than 100, say uh, 90, then uh, the equity holders 
would put the firm uh, to the debt holders or default. So uh, essentially the value of the firm, again, even if you had the simple model of, the, uh, of uh, risky debt, the value of the firm is, again, independent of the debt uh, to equity uh, ratio. It's just that the debt holders themselves have a combination claim, that's a pure debt claim, a riskless debt claim, and then also an equity component. Obviously, as the value of the assets of the firm falls, um, the debt holders uh, are then much more concerned about the value of the those ass the value of the assets. If the value of the firm increases, then the uh, the uh, value of the um, the, the uh, equity holders almost for sure will pay off on the value of the debt. So if you think about it, that if you if an equity hold if a person would buy the um, equity, which is the call option, and uh, uh, and then. Um, by the debt of the firm, which is the put option, basically uh, the, you end up having the firm again. And so that the initial uh, excitement that I had and Fisher had was to think about um, the debt and equity as being options. And as a result of that, still the miller medigli Annie arguments um, actually went through. That it, but it's just that the debt itself had features of equity, and um, and were uh, and uh, that was uh, very important in uh, considering the um, uh, in considering that risky debt itself would have those components. So I think that um, and Miller argued obviously that uh, both uh, taxes and uh, bankruptcy costs were small, and others have argued that here. But I do think that we have to take account on particular situations of the cost of adjusting leverage and the cost of adjusting leverage, um, especially when you have risky debt. Yeah, the cost of adjusting leverage might be large itself, and, um, but it not, doesn't necessarily have to do only with debt and equity, so that it's maybe that the capital structure issues themselves are important or not important, but it also has to do with adjusting uh, the operating policies of firms. So again, going back to the asset side, if you have risky debt. Um, so I, case, I think the current case in point is interesting because we have global financial institutions around the world that are having extreme difficulty in, um, in uh, readjusting uh, their capital structures. And the interesting point about a readjustment of capital structure uh, to bring it into uh, line is that if you don't adjust your capital structure and the value of your assets fall, then the amount of risk you're taking with the equity, the optionality goes up uh, dramatically. So the risk, uh, the percentage change in the equity obviously becomes magnified, but the percentage, but as Merton uh, had said that, you know, leverage is a, is a, is a two-edged sword, that basically uh, the more leverage you have, the higher the return on equity, but if it's the case is that if the value, if the value of the firm were to increase, but if the value of the firm falls, it's obviously the case that, uh, you know, the, the downside risks are amplified. So I think that we've seen a, uh, with a lack of flexibility with, among financial institutions and corporations that we create a destruction of wealth um, as entities, um, and I think as greater, the bankruptcy costs are quite large if we end up in a situation where uh, corporate restructuring or, corp or financial entity restructuring results in the loss of teams or human capital and uh, the reformation of those teams themselves um, have costs that have to be uh, taken into consideration. So I think if we have, you know, flexibility is an option or how much flexibility a corporation has in its operating policies and how much flexibility 
um, the corporations or financial institutions have in adjusting uh, their capital structures. A lot of the ways flexibility, in, in my view, is, um, is uh, being uh, close to a river and um, there's a hippo in front of you, hippopotamus in front of you, and you're between the hippo and the, uh, and the water. Now, that's not a very flexible situation because the hippo is going to run right through you to get uh, uh, back, to, uh, back to the water. So I think that the, uh, we never want to be in that, uh, that particular situation. So I think we, um, the idea of being able um, to convert assets into cash or to be able to finance activities uh, creates uh, a lot of the negative convexity issues that we all have to take account of when uh, making investment decisions. And what I mean uh, by sort of negative convexity is we can think of it as the things are going well and we don't have a need for flexibility within our operating policies that um, in, in that case that uh, Profits are greater, we're making a lot uh, more money in, in investments as well, uh, and, and that when we, we don't need the adjustment, then basically the value is much higher. So take the case of, um, take the case of uh, having a, a Volkswagen Golf, and uh, we are driving along, most of the time things are fine, but if we have to go up a hill, it tends to slow down so we don't have the acceleration to make it up the hill or the negative convexity comes into play when we want to put the brakes on. Uh, we're going down a steep hill and, and we don't have that, uh, that braking ability. But if we buy the, a car that has the flexibility to be able to take us over the hills such as a, a BMW um, or other fast cars that basically cost us more for those options, those flexibility options uh, that we need. And one of the interesting uh, facets of finance that reflect inflexibility is if we end up in, a, in the debt trap, namely we, uh, we end up in a situation as we see many of financial institutions today are in, is that um, the debt covenants that exist would uh, preclude, the, um, preclude the issuing of debt, which is peri passu to existing debt. So basically equity, when the firm wants to issue additional uh, uh, equity, uh, additional debt, the debt holders would say to the equity holders, uh, because of the contract or covenants, that the equity holders uh, are not allowed to issue debt but they are issue, They can issue additional equity. But if you, uh, if the firm then looks at the cost of issuing additional equity, that every dollar of equity that's issued actually supports the debt holders. So um, uh, more so than uh, than um, the equity holders. So it might be the case that issuing an additional uh, dollar of equity actually ends up only uh, that the the value of the existing equity uh, might fall such that um, might fall such that maybe 100% uh, is actually uh, reduced, reducing the value of the equity and benefiting the debt holders because the more equity that's issued, obviously, the debt holders have a greater chance of being paid off and a greater support. So the value of the uh, option that the equity holders is uh, reduced. This creates, for, in many situations, the, um, because of the inflexibility, the uh, destruction of equity value caused it to be the case, as we find with many financial institutions um, today, that if they issue equity in that Merrill Lynch's case or Citicorp's case or other uh, banks around the world, that um, uh, basically the, uh, the value of equity is, uh, is reduced dramatically uh, more so than the actual, in some cases, more so than the actual capital that is, uh, incre that is um, increased. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that, um, that uh, the bargain before the fact was inefficient. I'm not saying that, uh, that the amount of debt that the corporation used, uh, the banks used uh, initially, don't, 
does not violate the M&M &M propositions, the independence of it. It's just the consequences of actions have cost to the debt and equity holders, and those consequences have to be taken into account uh, prior to the, um, pr those consequences have to be taken into account uh, prior to the decisions that have, are, are being made. And that's really the key point, that once you are, end up in a, in a situation that is costly, it doesn't mean that uh, it violates the uh, Miller and Medigliani propositions. This means that the cost of adjustment is not zero at that particular time to the equity holder. So then in the case of risky debt and risky equity, then maximizing the value of the firm is different from potentially maximizing the value of the equity because uh, the, um, uh, the risky debt uh, has uh, the equity hold, there's a debt equity problem and it transfers between the debt holders and the equity holders and then there's a valuation problem the same. And the same point about um, uh, um, the, the same point exists currently with financial regulation with the crisis that we're seeing around the world. We have a situation today with our financial institutions akin to a child, um, uh, one of your children being on the barn and falling off the barn roof and having lacerations and cuts and broken limbs and then uh, being transported to the hospital. Obviously the parents would take the child to the hospital, but what happens when the child uh, leaves the hospital? Is it the case, does the child uh, learn to uh, monitor their own activities and not go on the uh, barn again under the same circumstances, or is it the case that we have to put new strictures and regulations on the child? And I think right um, now the idea of uh, the regulators in the United States are they know that we are going to expect many new regulations and rules uh, for financial institutions. The main uh, issue is to what extent can we allow learning and growth to occur in our financial institutions uh, because of the circumstances that have occurred that are actually not going to impede or not going to be costly, as costly uh, to society uh, going forward. And I think when one, of the, um, interesting, uh, one of the interesting effects uh, is that we are probably going to see restrictions on the amount of uh, debt that um, uh, that financial institutions can hold. So the debt equity ratios will be mandated or ruled for, uh, by regulators in such a way that banks and financial institutions cannot uh, have uh, uh, a certain amount, need a certain amount of equity to support their activities. Obviously we have to worry a lot about the unintended consequences of such rules and such, uh, and such restrictions because um, uh, we have thought that, uh, again, it's the, the trade-off between learning uh, in terms of how much, uh, how much equity is needed to support uh, the businesses going forward uh, on one's own or having one, sh one policy fits all where all, all financial institutions, regardless of hedging, regardless of their risk monitoring, are forced to take uh, the same amount of debt. And as a result, that does affect the risk taking of entities and also their ability to provide uh, financial services uh, going forward. So I think that the, um, we, ha we have to think and have to argue for different types of uh, regulatory structures um, going forward than uh, just having a standard um, debt to equity ratio restriction on, on, these, uh, on these financial institutions. I think that the issue is that the, um, sorry about this. Yeah, the three tools of uh, risk management themselves obviously have costs and benefits. And uh, we know that uh, the more diversification one has, the more risk reduction there is, the greater the amount of reserves we hold. That's uh, having uh, flexibility, the greater uh, the amount of uh, risk reduction there is, and the amount of insurance or ability to uh, insure also creates um, uh, uh, 
a sense of risk reduction. So I think that the ways in which uh, you can adjust or think about flexibility is really thinking about the cost of anticipating and adjusting to shocks, okay? And it's possible to be proactive or reactive to looking at how to adjust to uh, shocks. And it's the same thing as uh, thinking about to what extent uh, debt will impede my ability to adjust at times of shock, and or is it the case that uh, there's different ways to create hedging or contingent capital? Uh, and I think that what will happen from the shocks that we have seen over the last year or so um, will be, uh, if left to our own devices, uh, the financial institutions will uh, generate many new ways of creating flexibility in their programs uh, to adjust uh, that will have far greater benefit in risk management and risk management tools than can be mandated by any uh, government policy on, on regulating debt to equity ratios at, um, at financial institutions. And I think that there's a realization that the negative convexity cost or the cost of having to adjust. And, and it's interesting in running a business as a financial institution or as a fund is that you have to invest. I mean, it, you can't say, I'm just going to be flexible. I'm just going to have diversification. I'm going to have reserves. I'm going to have um, a lot of optionality or insurance in running the business. Because as Stu Meyer said, it's how do you create value for your investors? And as a financial institution or entity that if you don't take risks, you don't try to uh, generate uh, profits, then you can't satisfy shareholders either or investors either. And so the interesting problem is you're forced to invest. You keep, you're forced to invest, but you don't want to end up in a situation where you have not taken into account the cost of adjustment to shocks. It's the same thing as, as going out in, in um, Cape Town without an umbrella. If you go to, out outside without an umbrella, it's costly to carry the umbrella. That creates flexibility for you to carry the umbrella. But if it should rain, maybe someone at the corner will show up and willing to sell you that umbrella, but at a higher cost, uh, obviously, or you get wet. Um, and so there's a trade-off between how much flexibility uh, one has in operating a business or how much flexibility, financial flexibility or operating flexibility uh, one has because you can have, because that cost of flexibility is, is there, but still being too inflexible itself is, creates uh, adjustment costs that are very large. And so we have to, th I think that the development in firms or, or financial firms and regular firms is really trying to understand about the trade-offs, uh, especially at times of shock or crisis. And I think that the, um, with the, uh, compensation incentives, things that were also referred to in earlier discussions, that it tends to uh, push management not to carry the umbrella. Financial firms that I have more association with and knowledge of tend to, uh, given compensation incentives, actually uh, would prefer everything else being equal. Uh, not to carry the umbrella, and as Dick referred to in his conversation, those who are very successful in operating businesses probably did so without carrying the umbrella, with little more, less flexibility, and they got away with it. And um, so it's remembering or thinking about flexibility and how much flexibility to build in is an important problem both on the operating side and on the, on the financing side. And, uh, each has its cost, too little or too uh, much flexibility in how um, one op operates. And that flexibility comes in to play because uh, it's part of the entire uh, financial intermediation business, you know, the, uh, through liquidity, uh, the, uh, that um, uh, is very important because the idea of uh, liquidity or being able to um, 
operate, whether you're a private equity firm or a, a, a financial intermediary or a hedge fund, uh, uh, really uh, is um, uh, part and parcel uh, a very, uh, when markets operate or the ability to operate in markets, and I'll get to a definition of liquidity in a moment, but I think that it um, is coupled with the idea of um, providing, sorry, let me go back a sec here, uh, risk transfer services in the sense that uh, the whole financial intermediation business is geared on providing liquidity. It's also geared on providing risk transfer services. And the idea that hedgers, the, the willingness of us to hedge our risks or provide for this flexibility through a entering into contracts or activities with financial intermediaries, uh, who are the pure speculators in the Keynesian sense, that, that they are paid for providing uh, risk transfer and liquidity services to the market. So, and they, this is different from efficient markets that was referred to earlier, in the sense that it's not predictive, it's reacting to, um, to the services that are demanded by corporations and other entities such as pension funds or insurance companies or, or us as individuals in the society. So it's reacting to their uh, desires for provision of liquidity and risk transfer services. It's more akin to uh, the ordinance general in the army providing services that others are willing to pay for. But the difference between being a speculator and speculating, okay, a speculator actually is paid for carrying risks and providing liquidity to the marketplace and uh, allowing entities to adjust at lower cost, making the markets more efficient to be able to adjust their debt or equity structures or combinations thereof, while the active manager or the active manager is actually more akin to the war general, you know, the ones that uh, uh, fight the actual battles. And we know that other than those who survive to tell stories about their great victories, that 50% uh, of the war generals die and 50% of the war generals succeed. So. Uh, it is pretty efficient in, in that regard. So I think that the, um, there's myriad examples in finance about the uh, provision of liquidity and risk transfer services. I think that the key evolution in finance that has occurred over the last uh, 20 to 30 years is uh, 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 differences between generalized risk transfer and idiosyncratic risks. risks. To make money in a business, it's necessary to concentrate. If a business diversified across all activities bought just an index fund or bought a diversified portfolio of assets, you, there's no money to be made. There's just you make a competitive rate of return on that investment. To, to, to make money, it's necessary to concentrate. It's necessary to concentrate on the asset side of the balance sheet and take idiosyncratic risk. It's necessary to take those risks to actually earn uh, money. But what we've learned over the last 20 to 25 years, or more so in the last 10 to 15 years, is that does a corporation or does a financial institution need to maintain or take both generalized risks and idiosyncratic risks? And it's really the question of what risks one needs to take to operate, to, make, to add value for shareholders. Obviously, if the firm um, is taking both idiosyncratic and generalized risks, where idiosyncratic risks are the unique risk of running the business, and generalized risks are the risks associated with changes in the level of interest rates, or changes in the level of equity prices, or changes in the level of commodity prices, those risks can be carried forward through having um, a given uh, having equity in debt or having more equity if you take both sources of risk to support the business, or you can do so by having greater amounts of leverage or, and, and reducing the uh, generalized risks, because generalized risks are easy to transfer to the speculators in the market or through the financial intermediation process but specific risks are necessary to uh, retain to make money. And this is all 
financial innovation has occurred over the last uh, number of years to think about uh, the direction of the strategic use of hedging, strategic use of hedging to reduce the amount of equity capital necessary to support the operating activities of a business, uh, a business enterprise, especially now as the avant the guard or the forefront of this being uh, the financial institutions. So I think that the, um, uh, the uh, strategic use of hedging to reduce the need for um, equity capital by hedging generalized risks, the strategic use of hedging to produce products and services for clients to be able to price them more efficiently. Many of the products that were put forward by financial institutions before they could use hedging were um, done in a way where risks were separate so that the corporation said, if I can produce these products, I'd have to take into account the risks of doing that. So they would only offer products that they thought from their risk management perspective would be beneficial uh, to the firm. But now with the use of hedging technology and derivatives, it's possible to think about what the client wants, the products that the client wants, and be able to provide those to then use hedging to actually reduce the risk. Of, of. So I think that there's a tremendous growth of the use of hedging. So if we end in a situation where regulation says we have to mandate a debt to equity ratio, then the growth that we've seen in hedging and risk transfer and liquidity provision uh, will be uh, mitigated or impin impinged upon simply because of um, when uh, one is, is forced to have uh, a level of equity, it makes using these other techniques less efficient. And the trade-off between debt and equity and hedging is only transaction costs. It has to do with what's the least cost way of actually uh, providing the services that the business uh, wants to preserve, wants to uh, pr provide to uh, clients. So I think that the um, liquidity and risk transfer provision are the major profit, um, the major profit uh, engine of uh, of corporations and banks. And I think. One of the interesting problems that exist in the providing of speculative services or risk transfer liquidity services to the market by these financial institutions is how the financial institution is making money. Is it making money by being a speculator, namely providing these services and being paid for these services uh, by the um, entities that are using them, or is it making money by carrying risks forward in the market or by carrying inventory uh, risks forward in the market? And many financial institutions confuse how they're making profits. Basically, the idea of monitoring or being able to understand that um, they make money by turning over the inventory and not actually taking uh, the risks on the inventory uh, that they're holding. Um, what time, do, how much more do I have here, Till? Um, in terms of the timing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's, that's about it. All right, give me, give me a few minutes. Give me just to, to finish up here. One, one, um, uh, one of the uh, interesting problems that, about uh, liquidity in markets and being able to adjust debt to equity ratios is that, um, is that understanding the states of nature under which uh, we as financial entities or uh, corporations uh, might decide on when they will need liquidity and what the price of liquidity will be at that time is the aggregation problem. I can decide that I, if I, I'm going to move cities being able to think about getting an additional job or a new job in another um, area, can think about selling my home uh, very easily and readily and being able to move from, say, Cape Town to Johannesburg or vice versa. But at the same, if it happens that at the same time that um, uh, not only that I want to move, but myriad other people want to move at the simultaneously or sell their homes, then obviously uh, that 
creates a situation where there isn't liquidity in the market, the price of liquidity changes. So that in uh, deciding on how to, if a financial institution or corporation thinks that they can refinance uh, their activities, uh, that sometimes the cost of re, um, readjustment is much greater than other times. And figuring out how to hedge those states of the world is very difficult. The reason it's very difficult is because even though each entity might take into account uh, its liquidity needs, myopically it has to think about simultaneously uh, what other entities are also doing and when it needs liquidity uh, or the ability of markets to function, basically the price of liquidity uh, could be very high at that time or the cost of risk transfer could be very high. So those are um, uh, in terms of adjusting the debt and equity ratio when uh, these things, th those costs also, liquidity costs, the changing price of liquidity has to be uh, taken into account as well. All right, I'll stop there then. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>